Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Jack After Dark is back. He's being candid about Twitter's board dysfunction, uh, the takeover bed. And uh, we do a little dreaming, Molly and I, about what companies would we like to do a hostile takeover for? I know. I'm going to be, th- I'm going to keep coming with answers on this all week long because now yes. I just can't stop thinking about it. Um, I'm window shopping, if you will, for a public company of my yes. very own. We're also going to talk about Facebook's internet infrastructure development projects in Africa because Facebook just continues mm. with its controversial attempts to figure out how to get everyone on the internet through Facebook. Yes. It's not scary or dystopian at all. No. Uh, you can trust them. And (laughs) Better.com did another round of layoffs, uh, but maybe they're getting a little bit better at uh, how to do these mass layoffs remotely. And if you are a CEO staring down a downturn, consider these do's and don'ts big time. We also wrap up with an EV startup that's making a regional seaplane. It is an interesting, potentially inspiring startup of the day. Yeah, it's a really clever idea. Flies Mm -hmm. like 50 feet above the ground. What could go wrong? So it's going to be a great show. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. Embroker. Embroker's startup insurance program helps startups secure the most important types of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Save up to 20% off of traditional insurance today at Embroker.com slash twist. While you're there, get an extra 10% off using offer code twist. And Rocket. To hire in today's competitive market, you need outstanding recruiting. Rocket's expert recruiters paired with ML candidate matching set them apart from the rest. Get 20% off your first placement at getrocket.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. How are you doing, Molly? It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Doing great. Uh, Just Let me know. guess. What's on the dream? Living the dream. Today. Living the hmm. dream. Hmm, I wonder if we could talk about, uh, like, I don't know, social media moderation and maybe some crypto stuff. And, like, if we accidentally uh, stray into war, then it'll be... Yeah, trifecta. It'll be the twenty twenty two who the twenty two trifecta. Whoa, of whoa. Groundhog Day. So uh Jack Dorsey is back. Uh I call him Jack After Dark. <laughs> there was some moment in which Jack decided he'd start using Twitter. Uh <laughs> I think it was like year twelve of the service. He decided what a concept. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of been studying. I think I'm ready to start using this. I think I can take it out of beta. And he just started saying wild stuff. Like wild, great, mm-hmm. awesome, candid stuff. I don't know what's causing this candor. I think he's just had enough of the bullshit and he yeah. he's been doing it again. Uh ever since you know ever since he left as Twitter CEO, he's been doing a lot more tweeting and then since Elon put in a bid or started buying up some shares, uh Jack after dark's back. Mhm. Maybe you can recap what we got. I was going to say, let me uh, let me run us through a little bit of the drama. So the saga started on the weekend, April 16th. Friend of the pod, Gary Tan, tweeted the following. The wrong partner on your board can literally make a billion dollars in value evaporate. It's not Mm. the sole reason behind every startup failure, but it is the true story, a surprising percentage of the time. So interesting. Mm. Um, We've seen some of that play out in our various TV shows that we're watching. Based yeah. on real events, to which Twitter user uh, Tren Griffin, who is an investor, super smart friend super of Bill Gurley's, they just yep. had dinner together. I think. Oh, uh, I saw on the social media. Oh, okay, I'm like, oh, you, Tren's so you, a smart so blogger. He, he writes so Jason writes stocks, essays. Jen. He writes essays. He's smart. Essays. Well, so what he then he replied on Twitter in not an essay, but tweeting, I think, to one and said from uh, quoting a guy named Fred Destin saying, what I do know for sure is that this old Silicon Valley proverb is grounded in age-old wisdom that still applies today. Good boards don't create good companies, but a bad board will kill a company every time. So that's like a really interesting back and forth. And then Jack replied to Trent Griffin with two words. And those words were big facts. Big facts. Um, yeah. What? Yeah. So, I mean, the the last board uh, he had to suffer through was, you know, Twitter's got a long history of um, 
you know, the founders battling it out for who's in charge. You know, mm-hmm. had three CEOs at different points, Evan, DeCostolo, and Jack. Uh, and yeah, a lot, a lot of drama back in the day, perhaps a very big board um, with a lot of medium-sized owners, right? So it was complicated. And so then it, Game yeah. of Thrones, yeah. And so then this went on and said what unfolded was an amazing sequence of tweets. Uh, the user I Hadrami replied to Jack. If you and the, we'll just we'll just read this back and forth because it's fascinating and said, yeah. if you look into the history of Twitter board, it's intriguing. I was a witness uh, on its early beginnings mired in plots and coups and particularly mm-hmm. amongst Twitter's founding members. I wish it could be made into a Hollywood thriller one day. And then Jack replied, it's consistently been the dysfunction of the company, causing user uh, Yeet, <laughs> useless thinking to respond. Yeet. Are you allowed to say this? And then Jack to write back. No, <laughs> classic Jack after dark. <laughs> That's Jack after dark. It's kind of like the Moon Knight. Like he just comes out. He does. He just comes out. He's like, give me control. <laughs> give me control of the body. Give me control, Jack. <laughs> Scott Wapner of give CNBC. Me give me the account, Jack. Exactly. Give me the, the password, Jack. Jack. Give me the password. <laughs> <laughs> Summon it's on Twitter and the password. It. I mean, then, then you know, the the daylight Jack wakes up and people are like, whoa. <laughs> You okay, buddy? You all right? <laughs> what, okay. what do you mean? He wakes up like Your in a tweets field. tweets last like, night. He's like, I, I don't know what happened last night. <laughs> I didn't do this. <laughs> then uh, reporters get in the game here. Scott Wapner from CNBC. Ah, Serious CNBC. question yeah. for Jack. If you think the Twitter board is or was so dysfunctional and kept the company from being great, as you imply, either through your own tweets or replies to others, why didn't you do anything about it when you ran the company for several years? And Jack responded, so much to say, but nothing that can be said. Hmm. And then yeah. uh, Vinny oh. Lingham jumps in with the translation. Jack Friend is simply saying that as a public company with a bunch of self-serving board members, he did not have the power or authority to make the changes he needed to because of the short-term impact to the revenue and growth numbers, which they deemed unacceptable. I think that's probably accurate. They had Jack on a very short leash. They wanted to see quarter over quarter growth, uh, year over year growth. And they cre- had the cardinal sin. They made the cardinal sin of... Uh, when you're the distant number two to a juggernaut um, saying you have to play according to their success metric. For example, Google all of a sudden started dominating Yahoo. And then Yahoo kept trying to be Google. And that was not what Yahoo's strength was. Yahoo's strength was they had these content verticals. They had, you know, other services like games, things that Google wasn't into. Mm-hmm. Um, sports, videos, all that stuff. They should have just been Yahoo, which should have been a combination of, you know, some search, sure, but, right. you know, but culture, uh, articles, content, yes, video, yes. sports, mail, they had those great verticals that did incredibly well for them. Yeah, uh, where people and to this day, you know, if you want to reach finance people as terrible as finance.yahoo.com is, there's a bunch of people who use it as their default stock ticker. And then you go to the page and you look at the content. I was talking to the people who are running it now. And I was like, like, why should we should put this week in startups up on finance.yahoo.com and clip us and put us up there? Like, you've got no content there. What are you doing? Um, yeah. And uh, I, was, I was like, it really is gnarly up there. If you look at the content, it's all they sold all the stories. So yep. you go to y- finance.yahoo.com. I basically learned that if I click anything below my stock ticker, chances are it's going to be a paid, you know, marketing or ad. So it kind of ruined it. Yeah. Uh, but yes, this is. Um, well, so I let's look at, yeah. let's, let's play a, what do you think was happening? Cause it is very clear that there have been power struggles at Twitter. I mean, you point out just at the CEO level alone, the founder yes. and CEO level power struggles, gl- struggles galore. Jack seems to be uh, saying pretty clearly that the board was also uh, messing with them all the time. Let's like, look at the, tw- the Twitter board members and see if we can figure out who might have been right. Because you do have this sort of fundamental question, like, did the board interference stall mm. Twitter? And that's why it never developed more products? Or was the leadership saying like, no, 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 we just want it to be this really simple thing like Craigslist all along. On the board, you had Jack Dorsey, yep. Parag Agrawal, the current CEO, Brett Taylor, the co-CEO well, I think of these Salesforce. are the current board members, right? This is the is current it? board of Twitter? Yeah, and I don't know. Let's let's see producers um, who I don't know how far how much back turnover Parag there's went been. as an example. But I think everybody right. else probably was on when Jack was on. Probably. Okay. So Brett yeah. Taylor, co-CEO of Salesforce, 
Yeah. Probably knows what he's doing a little bit. Mimi Alamehu, yep. uh, Senior VP for Public Private Partnerships at MasterCard, Egon Durbin of Silver Lake. That's a newer one, I think, probably since that big stake. Martha Lane Fox, Lucky Voice Group, Omid Kordestani, uh, former executive chairman of Twitter, Dr. Fei Fei Lee from Stanford, the former CEO of Google, the CEO of FirstDibs.com, and then uh, the former chairman of the board of directors of Alliance Bernstein Holding. Okay. Who is the troublemaker here? <laughs> well, yeah. Got a lot of Googlers on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't know that right? this is a terrible like, I don't know board. Why yeah. This doesn't speak I, I to me as an that. activist board. Yeah, I, I think there were probably two iterations of the board. There was the venture board that Fred Wilson was on and Dick Costello and like that era, Evan Williams, where they were changing CEOs and who was going to run it, Jack or Ev or Dick. Right. And then what, what, what were they running it for? Because I think Dick Costello came in to add a business model. I think Jack was always a product person and Evan was always like super considered somewhere between the two. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think it's just been a, a dysfunctional board in terms of who got to run the company who is in charge and like people wanting to switch who was the CEO. And it's because also this company didn't have like a, a tight um, group of founders mm-hmm. between Ev, Biz and Jack, like um, all in sync of who was going to run it. So, right. I mean, it sort of seems to me like none of these sort of CEO Kings, right. There was like this, it's like you had this battle between the heirs to figure out who was going to be CEO, but it seems that maybe none of them had a strong enough vision or put enough a strong enough stamp or business model on yeah. it to keep everybody from meddling. What this says to me is that there was just always a power vacuum. And so the board came in and was like trying to meddle because if you're killing it, don't boards stay out of it? Uh, generally, you would want to get out of the way. Yeah. yeah. And then if you're trying to um, do a reclamation project, or you're trying to do a reboot or a pivot or whatever, you know, reorganization, that's like something that will take place over six to 12 quarters, like you would have to make a plan for a year or two or three. And so this two or three year plan was I think the challenge is I don't think anybody really ever got to execute against a plan or and none of those plans did in fact work to grow the service. So I think Dick had a good reign coming in and getting monetization and scaling up the organization and make it public company ready. Jack, I don't think ever got uh, a clear vision executed against it. He he wanted to do the open source algorithms. I think he wanted to open the API up. He wanted to do some bold things, but maybe the board um, vetoed him is what I'm getting the sense of. So maybe he felt like he couldn't take drastic steps because drastic steps might mean, as we talked about last week, if you want to solve the bot problem, you're going to take a hit on the daily active users. Right, right. You know, you, you want to get rid of trolling. You want to have more real names. You're going to be putting friction into the system. So do you want to have friction? uh, Or do you want to have activity? You know, do you want to slow things down, increase the quality, have friction? Or do you want to have more activity and growth? Yeah. And and sometimes it's bad growth, you know, it's like not sustainable growth, the more toxic people you allow on the platform, the more bots you allow on the platform, the easier it is to start a burner account, well, the the worse somebody's experience is going to get. So Listen, when you're a founder, it's fun to trade your craziest stories with other founders. Recently, Balloon CEO Amanda Greenberg, one of my portfolio companies, told me how Vanta's SOC 2 solution helped her save an important deal in the final hours. Yes, Balloon sells SaaS products and collaborative software. And when they needed 10 documents in place within 48 hours to close a deal, well, Vanta saved the day by supplying customizable templates for Amanda to fill out and helping them through the process all the way to close. So if you don't have your sock too tight, you can't close major customers like this. Vanta's compliance software makes it easier to get and renew your sock too. They continually test against technical and non technical sock two requirements. They partner with over two dozen audit firms who have been trained to file sock two reports directly within Vanta and on average, Vanta customers are sock two compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three to five months without Vanta. And guess what? Vanta is going to give you $1,000 off right now for your SOC 2 because you listen to This Week in Startups. Get that $1,000 off right now. Vanta.com slash twist. V-A-N-T-A dot com slash twist. Once again, Vanta.com slash twist for $1,000 off. I guess, do we have a sense? Do we know historically whether like that was something that Jack really wanted to do is clean up the bot problem? I think he was uh, very much into opening up the API again. Uh, and then opening, uh, doing this uh, bring your own algorithm kind of thing uh, yeah. and, and letting that happen. And I think he also had some crypto ambitions. 
I do also think there was probably a, a beginning of a conflict between the two companies, Square and, and Twitter. That was challenging because Square yeah. is doing crypto. Twitter's got crypto ambitions. They did that NFT thing very quickly. I think that was probably under Jack. Like, hey, I mean, what if this NFT thing takes off? We could be trading NFTs. We could be the place that people showcase their NFTs. Mm -hmm. And that's largely become true, I believe. People, if you want to show off your NFT, the best place to do it, I think, is Twitter. Your Twitter profile. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of a I mean, genius idea when you think about it. Um, and if they had their own cryptocurrency inside of Twitter, uh, I'm not saying like this is the best vision, but it's a vision. Mm -hmm. And if your Twitter handle became your wallet, like that's kind of dope. And you could store stuff in it. Kind of dope. So yeah, uh, it's I sort of feel I mean, I feel like it's very interesting to watch this back and forth. It seems quite clear that it's true that your board can come in and break stuff for you. Uh, not for you <laughs> can come in and break stuff. And also, I would say I'm not 100% prepared to take Jack's word unquestioningly here because he was also he was running two different companies. He was pretty checked out. He was like, I'm going to go to Africa for six months. I'm into this blockchain thing. Like there was evident. It, I would say if I were a board member, I would also probably be like, who's running the store here? Like, are you focused enough on this product? Or are you trying to turn it into this other product? And, you know, do you have a real plan here like i sort of feel mm. like a board doesn't come in trying to bigfoot a plan if there's not one already no they but they could just say you know you got some fractured board these six people these five people want to go for growth you know and these six or seven people want to go for safety you know right. that's probably right. where or, you know th there's probably opposing forces in how open the platform should be in terms of the api uh and allowing other people to monetize that a, a strict focus on making money and then, you know, radical plans for the product with regard to safety or new right. products, maybe acquisitions. These things could all become uh, very controversial. Maybe Jack wanted to buy something, you know, that mm -hmm. would have been extremely complimentary. They had a really good run of buying stuff. Periscope mm -hmm. and Vine w could have been, I think, like their Instagram and WhatsApp. They should have. I mean, kept we wouldn't that have string. TikTok right now if yeah. they had kept on with Vine. Um, they could Bob have kept G. pulling that string, yeah. Bob G asked, and I think we've sort of alluded to this too, would Twitter be different if Jack had had the same share as Mark, as Mark Zuckerberg does in Facebook? And that yes. is a really, really good example of like, now you have Zuckerberg being like, hey, I'm taking my giant social network and I'm turning it into a, a VR and AR company. I'm yeah, just doing a massive. Yeah. So if Jack had wanted to do a pivot like that and had yep. this super majority voting yep. situation, like no problem. This is where founder authority and, you know, we, we always debate like, Oh my God, you can't build anything in San Francisco. Uh, you can't build anything in Brooklyn. It's like, I think when you're saying like that scale building project and you're comparing it to China being able to build it, I think you're talking about you can't kick 50 people out of their homes, raise them, and then put a stadium on top of them without mm -hmm. them having a process to fight you. Right. And it's like, oh, you mean it's like a democracy? Like people have rights? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's you, you, if you give so up a lesson. bunch of rights, people can make unilateral decisions and right. unilateral decisions can have big outcomes mm -hmm. and great outcomes the lesson right. here is democracy doesn't work at all in companies <laughs> you know it, i'm think, totally joking by the way i i am not <laughs> democracy but <laughs> democracies think, create chaos and certainly at a company yes. you can't have no you cannot have like a democracy will slow you down it's a messy pr democracies are a messy slow They're process messy. yes and that's the strength of it right like you can't you can't change how many uh, terms the president can do very easily here in the United States. It's, that would be a messy decade long project, probably. We're seeing that play out right now. Yes. So mm -hmm. like certain things are hard to change. And mm -hmm. in a company, we have a God King. It's like, yeah, we're going to build a parallel company over here. And all the profits from company A are going to fund company B. The end, you know. I mean, what is let's so. Vote. Yes. <laughs> let's vote. Yeah, you're in. I'm in. Great. Okay, we're, I'm in. I'm, I'm in. in. That's all that we're matters. Done. Super. What is so fascinating, actually, is that I've made this analogy more than once on the show, which is that Twitter, because, you know, no one is so evidently in charge, operates a little bit like a DAO. And here is Jack saying like, oh, I want this decentralization and I want to pop up all these DAOs. And then we keep seeing these scams where basically somebody comes in, takes over a, a voting majority in a DAO mm -hmm. and then tanks it or steals all the money. And so I'm sort of wondering if Jack maybe isn't taking the wrong lesson away from this. <laughs> what company do you most want to run a hostile takeover for? I know. Uh, what could you you start? Me start? Uh, yeah. If you could take over, let's see. I mean, you can't take over Apple, but 
uh, if I Lame. could take over and just Apple, sit, sleep on your bed of money, hell yeah. <laughs> no, I would just go and mm-hmm. I would be like, I would take the brand extension to absurd levels. I would do Adam Newman as CEO of Apple. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Babushka, listen. <laughs> we Rivka. fly. Rivka, we fly. We fly. We fly, we fly. Rivka. Up bye, 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 so it, I would literally come in if I was Tim Cook. I'd be like, uh, go buy United Airlines. Yeah. Uh, and then I would turn it into Apple Airlines and I would double the prices and I would change the seats and make them Apple seats. Then I'd be like, okay, what next? What else do people do every day? Okay, great. Yeah. Buy me McDonald's. Great. And now it's going to be Apple's fast food thing uh, or buy me whatever salad thing. I would make Apple bread everywhere. Everything. I mean, can you imagine what you could do? with apple if you did have a zuckerberg or even a jack mentality of just like we are not going to be safe we're not going to just like live and die by the iphone e-bikes oh my god apple e- e-bikes yes great Boom. go yeah, right in bye, the store bye bye bye, bye. Yeah, here's a bunch of e-bikes <laughs> can you imagine you could buy an apple e-bike it'd be amazing you just i would ride the crap out of an apple e-bike yeah, find my e-bike uh but they, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of like to do one thing every 10 years and make it spectacular and then sell a billion. I mean, I understand the strategy. I would just go, I would pursue a different one. All yeah. right. Uh, there's my I mean, hostile takeover Apple. And then hostile and just do Apple. unlimited brand extensions. What are you? Let's see. What would you it's got to be about? tech, right? It's going to be a tech company. It's no, not going to be like, any it's not going to be like, world. it could be Disney. It could be any company. Pick a company. <sighs> any company. Ugh. Hostile takeover. And then what do you do next? Peloton, huh? You like the Peloton? That'd oh be my God. One. That's Fill actually a realistic house. one. Fill my house with Pelotons. Yeah, that would be yeah. a delight. Uh, I mean, because you can obviously like, it's pretty tempting to be like, I would take over one of the oil giants, one of the oil and gas giants and just be like, okay, we're doing it. We're doing renewable energy. Here we go. Yeah, well, we're you'd have to sell entire... oil to fund it. You'd have to sell oil to fund it. You have to do a transition plan. Yeah, exactly. Like you have a transition plan. Like the Saudis are doing, or like the activist shareholders are doing. But it's not, but to be honest, like that's not as fun. But I do think that those big oil companies have like employees with skills that we need to like, you know, pump ice onto glaciers to refreeze them or pump water. And like, I mean, you could redeploy those resources so effectively after you actually like kickstarted the transition Walmart? and made Maybe sure it was real. Walmart and just change the packaging. But right. Like what if you buy somebody, I think earlier, one of the notes said buy Amazon and then spin off AWS. Jay Sidhu said that, hmm. which would be super fun or buy yeah, Google. No. Like if you yeah, could do Google. a hostile takeover yeah. of Google and then just be like, okay, let's get yeah. real here about what are you Bring doing in hardware? YouTube. Split, just like spin out YouTube. Google pick six things and yeah. then do them and then stop introducing stuff that you just like, you know, bail yeah. on. Yeah. They're, 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 they like to dabble. The Google guys like to dabble. Right. They, but it means you can't, I don't buy any of their stuff now. Cause I'm like, I don't trust you. You're they should focused. dabble and spin out, dabble and spin out. It would have been great if they just spun Google fiber out into its own company, you know? Yeah. It yeah. would have been dope. I'm going to quickly explain one crucial type of insurance that all startups need. It's DNO insurance. You've heard of this before. You might not know what it is. This is directors and officers insurance, and it helps if somebody does something dumb and you get sued. I don't know how to tell you more plainly, or maybe you didn't do something dumb and some dumb person decides to sue you for a dumb reason. I have seen this. I've seen all flavors of it. You need to have DNO. It's just part of growing up as a startup and becoming a real formidable business. And if you don't have business insurance, well, you're going to have failed one of the first steps of being a founder. The best place to look for it is in broker and brokers technology is going to save you time. It's going to save you money. Prices are up to 20% lower and you get better coverage than the incumbents. You can go from sign up to quote and purchase in just 10 minutes. When you work with in broker, instead of all those slow incumbents, you're not dealing with those giant lumbering large companies. Sign up takes days, not weeks. And the process is transparent. There is no opaque pricing. So to instantly buy custom built insurance for startups, go to inbroker.com slash twist. While you're there, you're going to get an extra 10% off by using the code twist. Easy to remember this week in startups, T-W-I-S-T. Go to inbroker, E-M-B-R-O-K-E-R.com slash twist and use that offer code T-W-I-S-T. Yeah. Right, speaking of uh, Google Fiber, uh, it seems like Meta has been quietly uh, working on their access program in Africa. Mm-hmm. What do we got here, Molly? 
So uh, you may remember that several years ago, around about like 2016 ish, mm. Facebook tried to roll out this program called Free Basics. Free and basics. what it would do is be free internet access for people in developing countries in Africa and parts of Asia, um, wow. including India. And th- it was like, you get these free basics and Facebook, and we get all your data. Hmm. And all these developing company- countries, but as- especially India, was like, nope. Absolutely not. This is a massive violation of net neutrality for you to come in here and like give us free internet access, but choose all of the things that we get to see. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. Um, and so Facebook and was sort that of had part to, of it. They were going to like control what you saw on it or. Yeah, they would the- hand pick the sites mm-hmm. that were available via free basics. So it would be like, you huh. know, some health websites, some education things, Facebook. How can people you know, be so clueless as to like think that poor people in an emerging market would not understand they're being played mm-hmm. like if you're poor in and India, somebody's trying to like, play you, you you know immediately yeah because you've seen this movie before people coming in trying to prey on people who have less resources than them. absolutely i mean it's like literally so what obvious. is the difference in this case between facebook and like a gold mining company right yes. you know like come on like this is resource extraction yep and it's super painfully obvious so facebook backed away from that supposedly yep. And so then what they pivoted to instead is, okay, well, instead of providing an app, we'll just go ahead and literally lay the fiber. Got it. We will provide the entire infrastructure. So mm-hmm. in 2019, Meta partnered with Main One, a company mm-hmm. that lays fiber optic cables across West Africa to improve the poor internet access in the southern Nigerian state of Edo, specifically. 250 miles of cable have been installed. Meta's investment came out to about $20 million. And the investment has, as you can imagine, Meta would tout, help train 2,000 teachers across four schools uh, mm. and, you know, try to get Good people yeah. online, which is great. Sure. Emmanuel Eweka, a previous senior Edo government official, says, quote, I'd say Facebook actually loses in terms of making money out of those cables, but then they gain it back in the user data that they will generate. And obviously that has huge potential in a country like nigeria this is facebook attempting to do the same thing but all the way down to the pipes and i should point out here that google has been trying to do very similar things like i have a friend who is deeply deeply freaked out about the fact that the global internet infrastructure that's being laid and created right now is being created by private companies who Mm -hmm. sell your data i'm sorry (laughs) facebook will come for me over that monetize your data yeah yeah. And that there that's something to pay a lot of attention to. And some of these, I think, it is a situation where it, some places are just never going to get high speed. So I think some of the internet giants are like, doesn't matter who gets it there. If we can get some internet there, we have more customers there. So it's just a way to online another set of mm-hmm. uh, customers. And I guess the devil's in the details for all of these. But it does make you wonder what's going on. Also, I think this is all moot. I think a lot of this stuff is historical projects because Amazon is doing their low earth orbit satellites. They just announced they're going to be, you know, deploying hundreds of them, just like Starlink has. And so the, there are going to be, I think, four major low earth orbit constellations going on. So you're going to have four people with two, three, four, five thousand of these up there. There's going to be 20, 30, 40,000 satellites up there. Seems like a lot. But if I told you, you you have to put 40,000 satellite, imagine like the earth being even bigger, you know, mm-hmm. greater circumference than it is now. And then you had to put 40,000 backpacks or, you know, luggage rollers around the planet. Like you would never find one of them if you walk the planet for 10 lifetimes, right? There, there's really actually not that many out there. It seems like a lot, but it's yeah. dispersed over a very large field. And so this is all going to be... Uh, an incredible brave new world because all this fiber is great but for a lot of applications the satellite's going to do a good enough job uh and it's going to be uh yeah but then project kepler's coming you end up in sort of the same situation right which is you've got private companies in control of internet infrastructure whether it comes from space or on the ground facebook and google i looked this up in the interim facebook and google have been investing in giant undersea cables that connect the u.s singapore and indonesia yeah they're you know they're taking over where at&t bt and these telco led global consortiums left off in terms of building internet infrastructure so you know i guess the question is sort of like 
what does the global regulatory framework look like for this? And are we okay with, I mean, but it's, but in some ways it's not that dissimilar from the great thing is the internet is uh, a distributed, the original distributed application. So nobody can own any one part of it. And if you were to try to exert control over it, you'd lose it because people would, would just find another way to route around you. You might not be as fast. It might be slower, but with, with these satellites going up and having four different players doing that, in addition to everything that's been laid, right. in addition to 5G. So and now 5G. Yeah, yeah exactly. Don't count out the now, telcos there. I understand in New York, I saw somebody was testing in New York, like getting six, 700 uh, megabit on their phones and laptops with this like 5G, I forgot which band it is, but you know, the highest bands are now starting to be deployed. And I was just talking to a friend of mine in New York and they're like, yeah, I'm going to cut the cable and just get Verizon internet and i'm like what do you mean they're like yeah you just put this thing in your window and mm -hmm. your whole home is your like lt connection uh, and there it is actually that was the story i was reading of yeah. just like this uh bandwidth tests uh, the c band i guess they call it is blowing people's minds in uh new york so and to actually, the people asking in the chat like yes the current internet cables were laid originally by private companies but they're private companies that have FCC regulation, right? There, there, there is regulation, of, and a lot of public money went into subsidizing those. And as a result, they have things like peering agreements that require them by law to like share that access with other companies. Um, yeah. And so the question is like, if Facebook and Google put down a big undersea cable, do they have to let anybody piggyback on that no. ever? No. Yeah, that's a good. Well, they probably are going to want to have reciprocal arrangements with other people so if their cable went down their traffic would go over that so there is yeah. that uh, yeah there is that but it's interesting that and it's, it's fascinating that the, the, you know these companies just keep trying right it's just like putting laptops it's like how apple made the laptops cheap and google made the chromebooks cheap you want to get the kids when they're kids is how they're yeah. thinking about these companies of like the opportunity of the next what is it two or three billion to come yeah. online i mean it it's going to be everybody and so we're, we're, we're finding the pockets of people that, you know, are the, the pockets of resistance to high speed for whatever mm -hmm. dysfunctional reason. It could be the economies, it could be the it's government. It's not necessarily a dysfunctional reason. It's just timing, right? It's just there. Well, I mean, sometimes it's like some warlord doesn't want to let in, you know, oh, some, well, sure. you know, some internet or wants to control it. And, you know, like I think Cuba was another one where like they, the phones, People were still paying by the minute and it was like incredibly expensive and it's like all mm -hmm. these other countries wanted to come in and compete for that business and they're like yeah no no this is controlled by the state uh, right. you don't get to participate hiring well is one of the most important things a startup can do to increase their chances of having outlier success so if your current hiring strategies aren't working well rocket can help you rocket is trusted by companies like tinder nerd wallet and carta because it was started by former tech founders who understand how to hire at scale. Rocket was built by founders for founders, and they use machine learning to supercharge their team of 60 recruiters to help you close hires quickly and at a high quality level. They'll help you hire from freelance to executives, and this is a white glove service, folks. They're gonna save you time, they're gonna help you meet better candidates, and they're gonna lower the number of hiring mistakes. Rocket is currently helping a well-funded early stage API company called Rutter, R-U-T-T-E-R, -T -T and they're helping them hire across engineering, product, marketing, and sales, and it's going great. Rudder's founder had this to say, couldn't recommend a better early stage recruiting partner to work with. Here's your call to action. Get rocket.com slash twist and use the promo code twist for 20% off your first placement. Zero dollars required up front. So there's no risk. That's getrocket.com slash twist. And remember to use the promo code twist to save 20% off. All right, listen, I, 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 the layoffs continue. And they will continue until morale gets boosted. Until people turn around their bad attitudes, we're going to keep <laughs> laying people off. <laughs> Better.com started yet another round of layoffs. I, I can't it's tell like if they're this just is, practicing. How many people work <laughs> at this company? Like, are they do they keep adding a 1000 people so that they can lay people off every six months? Is that like a strategic objective here? It's like, like practice. A, <laughs> they really seem to uh it, it's like an it's like a groundhog day situation over there they started another round of layoffs this is their third in five months i can't believe how many people work at this company but you remember I know, i'm wondering about that too uh in uh december the ceo vishal uh vishal gard g-a-r-g 
laid mm-hmm. off 900 employees, which is about 9% of the company, uh, over Zoom in a very like cavalier, weird, passive aggressive, not gracious way. It was yeah. just deranged. Um, and uh, here, I, I reacted to it, uh, I guess, on the pod pretty viscerally, episode mm-hmm. 1341, 60 seconds. We are laying off about 15% of the company for a number of reasons. The market, efficiency, and performances, and productivity. If you're on this call, you are part of the unlucky group. You, dude. That is being laid off. Your employment here is terminated, Uh, effective immediately. Are you kidding me? What does this mean for what's next? You're gonna get an email from HR, askhr at better.com to your personal email address, regarding the details of your severance and your benefits for all U.S. employees. We're providing four weeks of severance, one month of full benefits, and two months of COBRA for which we will pay the premium. So three months total benefits if you elect for COBRA. You do this in, You would do this in smaller groups. You would do this in a more humane way. You would give people the ability to opt into it so the pain was lessened. You would take responsibility. None of that's happening here. And you also have this very bizarre effective immediately. You're terminated effective immediately. You don't have to speak to people that way. Yeah. So anyway, that was my my notes to that. Dip- uh, I don't think I'd, you know what? This is shocking, but I had not seen that video. Like, I yeah. am astonished. I had read the, you know, yeah. summaries of it. By the way, uh, for those who were listening, that was filmed by an employee who was yes. being laid off. Of so the cursing that you heard there, which I at first thought was Jason. Was not Molly. <laughs> was that was not me Molly. and was not Jason. Yes. That was the person being laid off. Yes. Um, who was, you know, gracious enough to videotape it and put it on Snapchat. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that was the initial one. Then he wound up getting suspended or fired. It was a whole back and forth of how bad this was. So in March, they laid off another 300, another 3,100 employees. So that's 40% of the company from its mm-hmm. uh, December peak. He's back, uh, by the way. He did not get fired. I want to be really clear on that. In yeah, terms of they, board was like meddling... A- some boards meddle, but some boards apparently do not because he had a 30 day suspension. Was it came a suspension? On That's so weird. And then fired 3,100 people what and a bunch of them that found out. What do you think he did? Did he ski 40 days during that 30 day suspension? <laughs> <laughs> I think he skied 40 days, didn't he? <laughs> he? He took his plane backwards in time and. And skied yeah. 40 days. Yeah, they didn't even call days. it a suspension, says Justin. Oh my God. So yes, the board was not that concerned about that. They apparently were like, no problem. So then they laid off 3,100 employees and a bunch of those employees found out when they got a severance check in their payroll accounts, not by being told Mm. uh, directly by their employers that they were being (laughs) laid off. And I think they also leaked it. So back to Mm. the present as, you know, practice, practice, practice. Wow. Tuesday, uh, today is the day we're recording this at 8 a.m. Better.com's chief people officer sent an email to all employees impacted by the layoffs. In the email, he mentioned that the affected employees would receive a one-on-one phone call from, quote, yes. leaders. Yes, that's what I that said to do after watching the lesson. It, this lesson. I know it's like we were in the um, pandemic and now it's over, I guess. Um, you can fly on planes without masks. That was a really interesting video to watch. What a and day. Like, Yesterday yeah, was a like, weird day. By the way, uh, it's just 30 seconds ago, you take your mask off. So YOLO. And then everyone on the plane takes the rest. I, mean, I was like, oh God, so never freaking been. weird. The Our 16% withdrawal from the pandemic of, is about the 16% as messy of as people without COVID just got it because everybody started yelling. <laughs> mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's pretty clear when you're talking. The vapors yeah. come out. I think we that was one thing we learned about these things. And keep the spit in, dum dums. Well, people not talking on planes is like the saving grace of why like it didn't seem like planes became petri dishes, or that was one theory. I guess the ventilation system. Anyway, ventilation. Anyway, long story um, short, doing it one on one is the way to go. If you're going to do it, you could just let people know the company's reorganizing over the next thirty days. Each yeah. group is going to meet with their managers, and we're going to resize. There's a chance you could be laid off. There's a chance we would want you to continue. There's a chance you get to choose. We'll have an option, um, but we have to right size the company. If you are looking at other opportunities, you can call HR at any time. But uh, each group will be uh, be doing this in real time. Sadly, this is there's no other choice of how to do this. Mm-hmm. And since you're not in an office, it's going to seem perhaps impersonal. And we're going to try to work against that by having one on ones with each person who's affected and and really yeah. trying to. Um, make sure you have the softest landing possible and uh, that we do whatever we can to help you find another great opportunity. And we appreciate obviously everything you did. 
It's a hundred percent on management. We didn't get here. Um, it's not nothing to do with you. This is a hundred percent our fault. Exactly. So like, you see the way exactly. I just said it? Like it's like just be a human and be normal. And I think that's the problem is some people are deranged fools like this guy. They are. Well, and you know, I mean, I guess the question is whether he's a founder and to what extent you like, this is really relevant to every company in every portfolio right now, because we may be, we're entering a right sizing period. This is not yeah. the last time a company is going to find itself having to do layoffs because it's, you know, too, too bloated because it was trying to blitz scale, let's say. Mm -hmm. Right. And that there is a playbook for how this is done. And in the process of building your company, you sort of have to plan for everything. And you have to yes. plan for this possibility. And in fact, I think some of our curriculum in Founders University and in the Accelerator includes some yes. basic preparation for these conversations. Yeah, there's a way to do it. it should. You, should, you should always have a plan A and a plan B. Like this is if we really crush it. And then this is usually when you build a plan. You have like scenarios. So this this is one scenario. We exceed the expectations. We hit the expectations, and we're below expectations. Twenty percent mm -hmm. more, twenty percent less, and on target. So you can kind of build those models. And hey, if we underperform, here's when we run out of money. Fourteen months. If we do it on plan, we run out of money in nineteen months. And if we overperform, we actually hit break even in month, you know, twenty one. Uh, yeah. So we'll be just fine, uh, and we'll be default alive. And that's your job as the CEO and the management team is to actually have those scenarios and be prepared for them. Yeah. And if the market changes, like it just did, where well, you can say, you know what, we had those three scenarios, let's build a fourth scenario, we're unable to raise money, and put more fuel in the tank, we're unable to raise a bridge. And we have to hit, we have no choice but to get pro to profitability on the money we have. Mm -hmm. In other words, no funding available, no funding secured mm -hmm. plan, they and extend the runway plan They like tighten up like you guys alive. were talking about on all in right if you yes. see the winds changing you make preparations yes. for that and yes. it doesn't mean that you i don't think that as a founder it means you don't sufficiently believe right it doesn't mean you're not you're failing to manifest your vision to make a plan for multiple situations because you don't know what you're going to encounter it doesn't mean you're like not having a big dream if you prepare for the possibility that your big dream might need some editing along the way here's the thing when you raise venture capital what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to staff this company for what it's going to look like 12 months from now, or 18 months from now, we're going to spend money as if we have um, $3 million a year in revenue. So we're going to have eventually we'll have 2.6, we'll have 2.2 million in costs to make $3 million. And we'll have this 25% margin or so. That's basically what our business will look like. So we're going to go right to 2.2 million in spend now, even though we don't have 3 million in revenue, we have 300,000. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to use that advantage to get to the 3 million in revenue marker faster. So we'll have extra salespeople, we'll have extra support people, we'll build a customer support group as if we have, you know, $3 million worth of customers. If they each pay $100,000, we have 30 of these. If they each pay 10,000, we have 300 of them. So. We have three hundred ten thousand dollar customers. We need to have this size support organization. Okay, build it now. Let's get it dialed in. Okay, it's not efficient. What we're trying to do is use funding to get to the milestone quicker. Now, what happens if you're really like going for it? You know, you're trying to get to the revenue number you would organically get to in three years. So you're spending like a company that maybe would have three years of bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, <laughs> you may not be able to get there. You may not be able to get there at that accelerated pace. And yeah a market that has headwinds. So you just have to adjust. And this is a company that obviously was like fast, just going too fast. Yeah. And so fast was spending money, right? If they were spending 100 million a year, and they were making 600,000, 600, like, mm -hmm. I mean, that is 200 x off 150 to 200 x like they would have to 150 x revenue. Ooh, that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot of that's a lot of doubles, you know, you'd have to double the revenue like a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, 1.2, 2.5, 5, 10, 20, 40, 80. Mm -hmm. About seven times you'd have to seven double revenue. You'd have to do this. seven doubles as the fast team to get to break even. That's how crazy their spending was. Yeah. A little too much, a little too much, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to see more of this. The other thing is you got to be very careful that you have the ability when you lay people off and you're giving them three months severance, now you got another trap. 
okay, in order to get these people off the books, we're going to need to spend a bunch of money to, right. uh, to offload right? them. Layoffs uh, are expensive. So also, <laughs> I mean, it argues against bloat too. I mean, the bloat thing yeah. is really real. Like the fact that they're laying off this many people at better.com makes us question. I think somebody said they had 10,000 mm. employees. I'm not an advocate for working people to death, but like, maybe that's too many people. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know what was going on there. It seems like way too many people. And you know, it's if, as we watched in the WeWork documentary, I think it's pretty accurate. Like, you want the crazy guy on your team, mm -hmm. uh, and until like the crazy person like goes too crazy, right? And it's a fine line. You know, you can be pushing and pushing line. and pushing, and there's you know, like, oh my god, we hit 8.9 million square feet with the largest, you know, leaseholder in Manhattan, and it's like okay. the largest <laughs> bag holder in Manhattan. You own right. the most. <laughs> Did you just celebrate that you have the largest like debt <laughs> in the, in the in New York? Like that that's yeah. not something to be proud of necessarily. Um, it it is a good it's a really good point about metrics. Like what is your what are your metrics and what is North your goal Star. and yeah. why are you trying to hit it? Cuz if your North Star is just size. Spe yeah, the number of least square footage. The number of like, least square footage. What does that even mean? That's just m money on fire. At some point, you, you would be Yeah, it's like being like, we've inventoried the most number of hamburgers, we have the mm -hmm. largest number of hamburgers in our walk in box. It's like, how many to sell? Yeah, I should right. be how many? <laughs> how many square feet have you profitably resold? That would be better. Exactly. And, or what percentage of your leases is filled? So if you had a 8.9 million square feet, the percentage least would be, you know, percentage resold in their case you know occupied desk shares like you know the percentage utilized would be my north star metric there because mm -hmm. that would be like super efficient right like right how efficiently are you running the business so when you right. take that lease how quickly do you get it filled yeah i'm not trying to blow up the biggest balloon in the world there's no reason for that no, no. yeah uh okay let's do the startup of the day this is everybody's mm -hmm. favorite segment we don't do it every day um but uh tell us what what do we have today Sort of, of the sometimes I sort of love sometimes. this. I totally going to call them after this and see if they're yeah. raising any money. Uh, Regent is building an electric sea glider. Sea okay. glider. I'm obsessed with seaplanes. And this is a sea glider, which is a oh, regional nice. commercial aircraft that flies oh. low above the water. It can go fast like a plane, but then land in the water and then taxi to a city's ferry dock. So kind of like a seaplane, but it. A, a sort of an alternate form of. Um, hmm. transportation, especially for like the succession people who are trying to like take a helicopter everywhere and all they need to do is just scoot across the water. Look at this thing. Wait a second. So it, it looks like a plane. It looks like a plane. it glides on the top. Oh, wait, it does come up. Yeah. It comes up and glides across the water oh, like a on ferry. A foil. Yeah. So it could, this is a rendering by the way that you're seeing on this yes. video, but it's like a foil. And so what it would replace is ferries it's and water ferry. taxis. It's just a fancy ferry, but it's electric. Oh, wait a second. It does fly right above the water. Uh-huh. It's oh, it comes out of the water completely. Oh, it can fly. Oh, look, it's going oh. over the Golden Gate Bridge. Interesting. So it flies less than 50 feet above the water. Yeah. Okay. Now I need to know if that is a safe thing to do from my aviation friends. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> okay. It, <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. If you're flying, don't you want to be like 5,000 feet above? So if something Rogue goes wrong, wave. you have time, but then you fall further. But here well, it's no, it 50 can glide. feet above the water. Like it can, it could, you know, even if there was like a, it can operate, I think the same 50 feet above the water. And then if there's a rogue wave, it could, I'm sure it's terrible. Well, what if there's However, like a downdraft and you smash into the water at what speed is it going? I guess 180 I guess it, miles an hour. Okay. That's not that fast. Uh, right. compared it's to fast, a plane it's not going like three, four, five hundred 500 miles. Yeah. I mean, a yeah. jet's going 550 miles per hour, 600 miles per hour. It's just a Turboprop high speed 350, I guess. Yeah. It's a high speed ferry. Okay. That achieves lift. It has 180 mile range, holds 12 passengers. This is why, by the way, this is why I'm the brand new VC who's like, I want to yeah. invest in everyone. And Jason's oh. like, whoa, 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 whoa. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like a place to burn money. <laughs> I see red flags. Yeah, exactly. They have plans wow. for their first commercial flight in 2025 uh, and mm -hmm. have orders from regional services like Southern Airways Express, the English Channel Ferry Operator, Brittany Ferries, and Mesa Airlines. By leaving from boat docks, the craft can save travelers time spent going to and from busy airports. So if you just needed to zip across 
from Paris to, to England, like you could see it replacing the yeah, channel um, thing. Uh, okay, so if you, let me think of another route. Mm-hmm. If we wanted to go to, yeah, and you also need to not, if you're going 50 miles per hour, you got to be careful you don't clip a boat. 180. 180. 180 I'm sorry, you want 180, 50 feet above the water. You got to be mm-hmm. careful you don't clip something. Because mm-hmm. ferries don't go that fast. Ferries are going 40 miles an hour or something. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, I wonder what regulations would apply at 50 feet. Is it an FAA thing or is it a Coast Guard thing? Yes. Like, you know how, like, when you have a slow moving boat and a fast moving boat, you have all. (laughs) You get both. I think you have the unique ability to get both. But 180 mile range. So, if you, I'm just thinking if you're going up and down a coast. So, if you Mm -hmm. left San Francisco Harbor Mm -hmm. and then decided to go, you know, I don't know. To Santa Cruz, to Monterey. Well, Monterey is a perfect trip. That would be under 100 miles. Uh, And so, you're telling me you could do that in half an hour? Or, you know, an hour door to door. That would be kind of cool to go to Monterey in an hour from San Francisco, I guess. Yeah. It's about I the guess. same to drive. And a cool little seaplane. Uh, now, if you wanted to go all the way to LA, that would be 300 miles and change. That would not be a good way to do it. I mean, and it might wouldn't be quite make beautiful. It. Right. Well, it wouldn't um, make it. You'd have to stop and either switch to a new one or charge up. I guess it only goes oh, 180 miles. Oh, it's 180 miles per hour and 180 mile range. Okay. So this is for Sydney Harbor. Or maybe Vancouver or something right. like that. Or the yeah, channel. San Diego, San Diego to, LA. to LA, maybe. Maybe it makes it, yeah. It that is interesting because be the, the chat is pointing out that it doesn't replace a ferry either because it's only 12 people. Maybe it's yeah. just a sightseeing thing as a proof of, uh, I proof think of concept some, for... You know, the Mediterranean probably wouldn't allow... You let the, well, I mean, could go to Italy to France or Spain to France. Mm-hmm. Or as you go from the Greek islands, actually could be like Santorini to, you know, whatever, Amalfi Coast, uh, Mykonos Definitely. to Amalfi. I wonder, but I wonder if they would let you actually do this. But it does seem like this is from the TV social session, not from reality. <laughs> it probably is. It's for it. I mean, honestly, though, there's nothing wrong with targeting a small niche, very wealthy audience, right? Like if you're just saying, no, okay, look, good place to start. this is replacing your helicopter. And then it, mm-hmm. we're going to build up the range. We're going to like make it go faster. We're going to sort of come up with different use cases for it over time. The CEO founded the company in 2020, Billy, Billy Tallheimer, previously worked on EV Evtols, mm-hmm. um, basically, you know, these electric uh, planes in many cases. Vertical at Boeing's, takeoff and landings. Vertical takeoff and landings at Boeing's research division. Boeing bought Aurora, the company I think he was previously at, which is not the self-driving trunk trucking company. And then uh, this company, the Sea Glider one, it mm-hmm. raised $18 million, co-led by Teal Capital, Jam Fund, and others. Um, these VTOLs are starting to also get traction. I think these things are going to happen in the next 10 years. And Definitely. They're, they're, because it's going over water, there's just less people impacted by it. I could see this working really well between the Hawaiian islands. Like I'm not sure the exact distance yeah. between each one. Uh, but, you know, those are, you know, little puddle jumper flights. I can yeah. see this doing really well in Cape Cod area, like going between Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard and the Cape and Long Island mm-hmm. could be dope. I mean, short haul yeah. flights are the vast, vast, vast majority of flights. I just talked it. to an electric airplane company that I'm super into, and that's what they were saying. It's like 70%, 70 to 80% of flights are like a sub two hours. Well, so Cape, if you can figure yeah. out how to electrify, the, electrify those routes massive impact in terms of fuel usage sound like you know how quiet our electric cars are imagine if 70 to 80 percent of the takeoffs and landings at regional airports were effectively silent uh, amazing th- that's going to be nice as well well this there's a company eviation um and they yeah. sold to cape air 75 electric planes and they're doing it this summer is my understanding Mm-hmm. Uh, these are test flights this summer. Yeah, right? And these are small. These are real small, right? They're like, um, I think it's probably six people, maybe eight. I'm not yeah. sure the exact number, uh, but we can pull it up here because uh, we have producers who do this live. I think it's like four or five million bucks per plane and they bought them or they put the order in. So like, it's actually, uh, I think this is actually happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has a small number of people because yeah, Cape Air is like little puddle jumpers. and. They're electric. Cape Air is like they use probably Cessnas or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, this new Alice airplane, if you go to the aviation website, you'll see it. It's actually flying. 
Um, and it's a commuter air mm -hmm. line. If you pull up the website for aviation, you'll see like a nice little looping video of it. And it's pretty good looking. Uh, and the, they're very short, right? So yeah, it doesn't have a lot of weight, but it looks like a little Pilatus. Uh, it's funky looking. I think it's designed to be super uh, aerodynamic. So aerodynamic. Thank yeah. you. And they have a commuter one. It looks like four by four. So probably eight people. And then they have an executive one, which is like six. And yeah, you just charge the batteries. It is a fully EV. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has any gas uh, engines. So. Fully EV. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's be just pretty dope when you think pretty about it. Dope. To, like when we yeah. get there, it's freaking fascinating. And It'll so impact, like so impactful in terms of pollution and sound. Not, like the fossil fuel impact is amazing, but the pollution around airports, mm -hmm. the sound, the fact that you like can't build houses there, it restricts our ability to build regional airports because people don't want them in their towns. And then as a result, I don't know how often you fly to the middle of the country, but mm -hmm. like I do because my parents live there. It can cost as much as going to Europe to fly to the middle of the country because there just aren't airports and planes. And part of the reason is because the infrastructure is unwanted, expensive, polluting, loud, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think the uh, other possibility is maybe um, using jet fuel to get to 30 or 40,000 feet and then being able to use electric power for mm -hmm. some portion. Because I think you need a lot of energy to get this weight in the air. But once it's in the air to keep it going, you might be able to do like you know, a hybrid car kind of situation where there's for sure going to be hybrid opportunities. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of opportunity in the space. And I think it's really interesting. I'm, and it's and I sort of feel like I'm fine with the fact that this, you know, Regent and its sea glider is like a little funky place to start because it's all about proving the technology, I think, over time. Yeah. And the batteries as what we're seeing is really what the happened storage. with batteries for the mobile phone then impacting what happened for batteries for cars, right? Because the original Tesla battery pack was just like a bunch of cell phone batteries in a pack. And then it'll go to aviation and yep. home storage. So everybody bought phones, everybody wanted their phones to last longer, all these scientists got super, super geeked out and how to make smaller, safer batteries. Remember, they used to go on fire in laptops, mm -hmm. so they made them safer. And they made them cheaper. And they made them at scale cars safer cheaper at scale yeah boom now planes that'll be the ultimate beneficiary and also uh, eventually ships right like no reason a ship can't do this oh 100 well. percent. electrifying shipping will be a game changer although you have to go across like most of the planet so that's going to be longer i think that's where like a hybrid solution really comes into play and it's so interesting that's why i like ryan peterson who'll be speaking at the oil and summit i like his uh you know give me a shipping container with solar panels on it that just drives itself across how totally. dope would it be if like all of a sudden a shipping container like drives up the beach you know like in long island a Freaking truck awesome. comes drags it to a depot it's got seaweed on it whatever they unpack it and then like the trucker just drives it like it's like a baby seal or something to <laughs> the edge of montauk <laughs> and it's like get out of here kid and like oh things God, like, but i want to stay and the tr you know the trailer is like little ai trailer goes into the ocean it's like i want to stay no it's like, no you got to go back to shenzhen it's like wally <laughs> Aww. Yeah, and then the, this poor little shipping container has to go across the ocean. It takes it a year because it goes so slow with solar. And it's all lonely under there. And then it comes there. up the beach. It makes know, friends with the whales and turtles. Kong. Yeah, like no, it's got turtles living on top of it for a year. And it just never has a home. Its home is on the road. And it's just... This this Pixar film is writing itself right it's, now. I mean, it really this is beautiful. I hope somebody's listening to it's this just from like the movie containers, world. Containers, ships went away. And the containers all became independent contractors. It was like a new gig economy for the AI shipping containers. And then some of them unionized. Some I was going to say, then they didn't like their working conditions because they keep getting attacked by sharks. There were in the middle sharks. of the ocean who would beat up other shipping containers. They Definitely. surrounded it. Pirates. 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 Autonomous pirates. Autonomous shipping container pirates. I mean, if I were a computer, I would definitely be like, hmm, the best way for me to reach maximum efficiency is to steal this guy's stuff. Just saying. It is, be it is well, it's also becoming a thing that <laughs> Did um, I just like these shipping containers sometimes have, um, you know, they fall off of shipping. We know they all fall, these things fall off, right? Because mm -hmm. they're just throwing them on the top of a ship. <laughs> and, like, they don't tie them down, I guess. Like gravity keeps them on. I'm like, really? Is that how this works? You just stack them like Jenga cards, like Jenga centrifugal bricks? force? That's your plan? Yeah. <laughs> and, but I, I'm assuming they're locked down. But sometimes I guess they just, the thing tips, they fall in. 
Well, yeah. now what's happening is some number of those containers ship to the bottom, right? They sink, they're heavy. Other ones have some buoyancy in them, right? There's cardboard, there might be something that's a little floaty. And so they, they stay on the top. And then mm -hmm. a small number of them kind of are just below the surface. And so what's happening is ships are hitting containers uh, that are slightly under the water, you know, or float up and down under the water, above the water over time as they dry out or whatever. And no idea. And they rip the hulls off of ships. So people have been losing their rudders and hulls by, it's a freak accident, but you can look it up online. So some guy was Dang. doing one of these like cross Atlantic solo suicide missions, you know, people who yeah. like, yeah. like, you know what, I'm not talk about self harm coming if, uh, trigger warning. You know, some people are like, you know, what I'd like to do is really risk my life in a way that makes no sense. And <laughs> I'm going to commit like a slow public suicide by going around the world alone. Or I'm going to accomplish this incredible thing through sheer force no. of will and no, training that's and not preparation. What you're doing. Nope. No, no. If you did that, you'd have two people with you. I'm talking about <laughs> the solo people. <laughs> What's the difference? If Alex Honnold scales, you know, El Cap with no rope and there's somebody on the side with a rope, it doesn't take away from his achievement. Like these, I'm talking about True. these yokels who were like, I'm going alone. It's yeah, like, no, I know. To go mad and eat your fingers. Okay, great. And so anyway, this guy got he thinks he lost his rudder from one of these instances because he just heard uh, a big bang and then he has no rudder so he has no rudder so he has to put out uh those bags you know about those bags you can put behind a ship so there's a, a no, uh, why an do you know so much sand. about this so you throw this thing off the back of your boat if it's got no rudder and it's a bag that sinks down below the water and then you just pull the rope and you can steer your ship steer with, with this like bag it's like a nylon bag not. you throw in the back of your ship and you get a rudder. That's wow. pretty smart, right? It's for it's emergency smart, situations. So this guy yeah, had to like he's... somehow navigate the globe with that. All right, everybody. Uh, and then in uh, minor news, Bloomberg's sources say Zendesk is working with M&A advisor Catalyst Partners mm. on a potential sale. Zendesk is trading at $15.7 billion, up 6.3%, generated $1.3 billion. So it's trading at just over 10 times revenue wow. uh, on lo modest losses of 224 million. So there's an easy buy for somebody. Mm hmm. Interesting. Um, we'll right. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. And then just keep so you know, in the coming days, of course, there are going to be lots of tech earnings. So just Oh, the tech earnings look out is coming, for us to get is... to geek out about tech earnings. Yeah, well, I mean, it's actually it's a great way to see what's working, right? Because the strategies announced last year, the year before, then we start actually seeing if those things are actually working. Also, it'd be interesting to see what's going on with the economy because my thesis exactly. is these are going to be incredible earnings again. We're going to see Netflix, Meta, Tesla, Microsoft. I mean, it's going to be, I think not. I, I think that, that's not all this sick. week. Maybe Tesla might be this week. Anyway, yeah, it's going to be. I think the earnings are going to be sick. Here's my theory. Okay. Because um, we haven't hit the hard part yet. No, I think uh, people working from home and being able to hire talent anywhere has added a dimension of efficiency to these companies uh, that didn't exist before. So if you needed some to hire somebody in some very particular thing, and they had to work in one of seven offices, and mm -hmm. they weren't near that seventh off one of those seven, or didn't want to relocate, you didn't have that employee. Now, hiring managers like, okay, yeah, you're some ski bum, you know, and living in Tahoe, and you can do the work on your computer, do it. Right. Uh, so I think there's going to be unlocked efficiency because of remote work. And then all that YOLO money sitting around. I think people are buying and consuming more than ever. I mean, clearly supply chain constraints would indicate that they are because it's not just constraints. It's the fact that they bought so much stuff, it can't even get here and get unloaded from ships and containers quickly enough. Tesla is tomorrow. Thanks. That's going to be. It is going to be fascinating. I just think that no, I mean, the scale of the production, I have no inside information, obviously, nobody does. But um, I mean, the, the number of cars I'm seeing and the scale of the production, the number of people in my circle talking about should I get a Y I'm upgrading my S? Do I want to go to the I mean, I'm literally in multiple chats where people are upgrading their Teslas. And this is the other thing I think Tesla has done so well, they make it so easy to buy a new car that I went to, you know, it's like, oh, I want to buy a car. I was like, ah, uh, I don't want to go through the car buying process. Totally. I'll just wait for Cybertruck. I was like, I, I yeah. don't want to go through the car buying process. I'll just wait for a Cybertruck to I magically mean, appear. When I was EV shopping, like it is just an absolute deal breaker at this point, having gone through the Tesla experience to interact with a dealer. 
So the car I bought is the one I really loved the most. And also, though, like maybe there was a Hyundai that I could have tried, but I did not want to deal with mm. the dealer situation. Yes. Like they brought the car to me to drive they and then I the bought keys. it on the internet and then they brought it to my house. Like it was very yeah. Tesla-esque and like everybody, once they copy that, <laughs> you'll sell yeah. a lot more cars. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's going to be fascinating, but I also like there is a tech crunch. I know we have to end. We have a whole show, but I'm curious to see hmm. related to Tesla tech. There's a tech crunch earnings preview where they say maybe we're going to get a glimpse into the part three of the company and the, oh, the mission, yes. which is writing, much more about the infrastructure, the renewable energy part of it. Like, I'm super excited to hear more about that, too. Uh, I think the thing that's been hiding in plain sight is the factories. Mm -hmm. materials in one side product out the other mm -hmm. so this um thing that elon's been talking about a lot and he talked about it at the gigafactory rodeo is can you have no suppliers and can materials come in one side and then a car come out the other without you having to be waiting for somebody who makes your screen or who makes your seats that kind of thing like yeah. how much of the car can one car company make because a lot of this has been these oems and basically, you're as fast as your slowest, most incompetent OEM as a car manufacturer. Yes. Um, outside equipment manufacturer. So obviously, you know, there's somebody who does cigarette lighters for 99% of cars, you know, as one bad example. Mm -hmm. There's somebody who does windshield wipers for 67% of car manufacturers. They don't make their own windshield wipers. I think what Elon's been doing in these factories, the dreadnoughts, the factory is the project, right? Yeah, so 100%. What Anything can come out of it, right? You just snap on why snap on cyber truck boom and you're done so yeah that's i can't wait to see it uh, so interesting yeah we can't we can't wait to hear it was more. also so the don't go too crazy i don't know if you remember that he was like i'm just telling employees to not work so hard don't go too crazy you know we want to build for quality and sustainability you know after we had all these near deaths experience with the model three elon did tweet that which i thought was like either a sandbag <laughs> or like you know okay yeah we don't have to burn ourselves out like let's just play for longevity here and consistency um, well there does have to yeah there's a strategy after uh there's a strategy after domination right like yeah. prove that you can create the first american car company since ford yep and get cars on the road yep. and create infrastructure for those be right like once you have proven the concept which is like near impossible to prove by the way like all 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 I think I get mistaken for not giving Elon enough credit for the fact oh. that that is a phenomenal yeah. achievement. That yes. is an accomplishment that is like to Crazy. also pair that with a spaceship company, like a rocket ship yeah. company that's actually sending people uh, unparalleled accomplishment in yeah. human history or American history. Wow. Once and you do that. Wait till he figures out, wait till he figures out self-driving. You know, that's going to be the next one. I mean, wait till he figures out actual electrification. Like what's yeah. wait until those cars have you know, bi-directional charging and they can power mm. your house because you've got the panels and the battery. And like, I mean, there's so much phenomenal potential there anyway, but you, I think it is really, I think it's great that he's like, don't burn out because you, now yeah. it's like, you got to build forever. Yeah. I mean, the fact, the size of that factory, I'm just, I've never seen anything at that scale in my life. It was like going into an alien building and being like, yeah, this is how like the engineers, you know, made humanity. <laughs> like it feels yeah. like a scale it has its that own you weather. can't imagine. What's that? Is it? What's there? There's like a Michael Crichton book where he goes in a building that's so big that it has its own weather. Uh, oh, really? That makes sense. Yeah. That looks I like mean, one that might. Yeah. This thing is like. Good Lord. Look at that. It's like a mile long. It, I mean, this is the thing about moving to Texas. Like you could never build this in California. You'd still be in planning. Like, and he built it in under two years there, I think. Yeah. Like it, it's insane. What was yeah. the, what, what was the groundbreaking date on Gigafactory? 4 million square feet. It's got so many square feet. Like, I think only a third of it's being used at the start. So this thing has the ability to like, you know, have a lot more stuff going on in it. The scale is just insane. And it was mm -hmm. built in, you know, a couple of years. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary how big this thing is. August 12th, 2020. This is the one in Del Val. Wow. That's nuts. That's nuts. Bonkers. Hey everyone, producer Nick here. I want to tell you about the SaaS syndicate. If you're a founder of a SaaS company with a product and market, our investment team wants to talk to you. Head over to the syndicate.com slash SaaS, S-A-A-S, 
to apply to raise from the SaaS syndicate. And you can join Jason's syndicate of over 9,000 accredited investors at the syndicate.com. Producer Justin here, know a cool startup? Check out openscouting.com, where anyone can refer a startup to our investment team here at launch. Even if you don't know the founder, if you're the first to flag a company for us and we decide to invest, you'll get 5K in cash or 10% of our carry. Hey everybody, producer Rachel here. Are you an early stage startup that has product and market, some traction, and are looking to raise at least $500,000? Apply today to Remote Demo Day for your chance to pitch to over 9,000 investors in Jason's syndicate. Submit your application at Remote Demo Day Day.com. Our next event is on April 27th. And if you want to learn how to invest in startups from the world's greatest angel investor, and no, we're not talking about Chris Saka, then head to angel.university to apply. The four-hour workshop costs $300 and all proceeds are donated to charity. To date, we've donated over $175,000 to various charities, and you can see the full list at angel.university slash charity. 